This recording was taken at the Utah Thrive Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah in June of 2019. I started my faith, um, faith journey about 10 years ago, and I literally have waited 10 years to, to speak to this group. Um, my number one rule as a speaker, I saw several of you use cell phones, and usually they tell you to put your cell phones away. When I'm speaking, you can turn your cell phone to the on position. You can talk to the person next to you. You can disrupt. You can make all the noise you want. I primarily work with people with severe behavioral issues, learning disabilities. Um, I work in over 200 prisons, so I'm not used to people listening to me. So <laughs> it is okay to be highly dysfunctional. And I love dysfunction. If I ask a question, do not raise your hand, yell at the answer. You know, I know Lisa used a euphemism, and she said it's whatever effing great that he's fetching good. I'd rather you just say the F word, all right? See, I can't even do it. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, sorry. <laughs> I've never said that professionally. Oh no, that might be on camera. All right, don't let me. But no, just <laughs> holy cow, euphemisms. That just brings me back to post-traumatic mission experiences. Um, <laughs> all right, I've been waiting for this audience my whole life. <laughs> Nobody knows. Holy cow. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> well, I've never felt this at home in my entire life. <laughs> This is, this is like seeing um, 200 Christian Moors in a room. This is really bizarre. Um, so I want to start out by sharing my most embarrassing experience in life, because I'm not nervous once I share my most embarrassing experience. It happened in the first two years of my life when I was born. My mom thought I was the cutest baby boy that she'd ever seen. Any moms or dads here? Raise your hand if your child's the cutest child in the whole world. <laughs> Right, my mom was under the same delusional belief. If, if you ask my wife, Wendy, she'd tell you my two boys, Cooper and Carson, are the cutest kids in the whole world. But my mom was so extreme with it, she decides to put me in a baby contest that covers all of LA County, all the way down to San Diego. She tells all her friends, all her girlfriends, Christian will win first place, hands down. There's no way he will not win this contest, just to illustrate my cuteness as a child. Uh, all right, that's the greatest Oz I have ever gotten. All right, thank you. Thank you. If you're a little boy with curly hair, what do most moms usually do? They let it actually both, but yeah, grow out. Either they're going to cut everything. They grow. So this long, long, curly hair. She says Mormon, they would cut it. Right. <laughs> so this long, curly hair. And luckily for me, the day of the contest, my mom was too ill to take me. But she knew I needed to go because there's no way I wasn't going to win this thing. And so she decides to have her brother, my uncle, take me. He decides, I have a sister a year and a half older than me, he decides to put me in my sister's pink dress. And I won first place as the cutest baby girl in all of Southern California. So, well, you, start, you gotta learn resilience, you know, really early in life. So I went from that failure to literally, I, I speak for the opposite reason. Usually people speak because of success or accomplishment, all, all joking aside, I get the opportunity to speak because I'm one of the world renowned leading experts. So I call the two F's fear and failure. I attended the University of Adversity. Um, the other day, a gentleman came up to me and said, Hey, you know, you're the author of the book, The Resilience Breakthrough. And he said, You know, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you, but just what's the number one ingredient a person has to have to be resilient? And a thousand thoughts he went through. Like, one thing I can tell you that you have to have to bounce back, you know, resilience is this ability to bounce back. What's the number one thing you have to have? I'm like, Oh, and finally, I just said to him, I said, Suffering, <laughs> because until the suffering shows up, you have nothing to bounce back from, right? Anybody besides me dealing with some suffering? <laughs> Only five of us have suffering? <laughs> we all know it's the human condition. We all deal with suffering. So the ability to use that suffering as a fuel source is one of the most powerful things I've ever been taught. Now, in the last 20 years of speaking, I'm going to be really frank with you guys, I have not really written much notes. I just kind of jump into my resilience and my curriculum, different things. But it's interesting. As I was preparing for this speech to you guys today, a thousand thoughts were going through my mind for like two days. I couldn't even compose my thoughts. Kind of like, I, could, I want to focus on this. I, I got to talk to them about this, 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 and this. And so I just started writing some notes. And then I just started writing a couple paragraphs. And I thought, Man, there's no way I could just say this. I, so I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to break a rule of professional public. I don't usually read when you're a professional speaker. But I, um, I'm going to read just a couple paragraphs to you that um, kind of put into context. It's kind of a tribute to you guys. 
and I want to pull that up right there. That's a whole other workshop there. All right, <laughs> we'll get to that. Let me pull this up right here. All right, so let me read this to you real, real quick here. Because um, I, I feel like this is family here, so I want to share something with you from, from my heart. It says, you know, I want to start out by establishing my um, Mormon street credit. That's what we usually do, right? Um, I'm curious. I'm so curious because of this audience. I am the, you know, one of the great-great-grandsons of a gentleman, a great pioneer named Anson Call. Anybody related to Anson Call? Any Anson Call relatives in the room? That's fat. Well, one Anson Call relative. I think they're like the third, second or third largest Mormon family are, are the Calls. Um, reading his journal, uh, on my mission, I had someone put a gun to my head, went back to D.C. where I grew up, and wrote a letter home to my grandmother telling her about, yeah, man, someone put a gun to my head. And she said, ah, no big deal. Your family's risked their life for this church for a long time. And he sent me, um, they sent me Anson's journal. And I'm reading his journal, and in the morning when we get together the missionaries, I start pointing out to him, I'm like, uh... Joseph's trying to hook up with his wife. You know what I'm saying? We're just pointing this out. I'm reading this stuff, and I'm, and I'm showing this to my companion. My companion's like, that's not real. So I go to my mission president, and I, he goes, get that journal home right away. You know, just sitting there. And that was my first waking. Does that make sense? That something, wait, hold up. This ain't the Mormonism I grew up with. <laughs> There's a whole other workshop going on here. And, uh, and that was an eye-opening experience. Then, when I was taking religion classes at BYU, because I, I had studied his journal, I had, at that time I started reading tons of, of um, pioneer journals, and I would sit in religion classes and raise my hand and say, hey, that's not what really happened. This is what happened. And then they would pull me aside and go, who are you? How do you know this stuff? And I said, well, I'm his great-great-grandson, and they're like, hey, you know, we got to give people milk before we give them meat. Um, you can't talk about this in class. And stuff. But they didn't say that I was wrong. Does that make sense? This is, like, this is like, you know, almost 20 years ago, and that was a really eye-opening experience for me. But, but Anson was taken advantage of. Anson, you know, lost kids, had tremendous sacrifice. He did not have access to this information. I only had access to this information because a guy named Steve Jobs put an iPhone in my hand. I have learning disabilities, so an iPhone is, you know, you, you don't have to be computer. I wasn't computer literate at all because of my background, but an iPhone, it was just touch. I could figure stuff out. And had Anson had access to what I had access to, I do not think he, I think he would be pretty pissed about his sacrifice, but, <laughs> the, um, but I want to dedicate because he was highly taken advantage of from what I understand. Um, the other Mormon cred I have is my other grandfather is a guy named Reuben Law, who was the dean of education at BYU, and um, he got in, almost a fi in his journal says almost a fist of cuffs with Wilkinson because my grandfather wanted divorced women to go to BYU, and Wilkinson did not want divorced women at BYU, and he argued, who needs an education more than a divorced woman? So again, they almost got into a fist fight over this. The secretary had to break them up, and, and so they take them up to Salt Lake to meet with David O. McKay to figure out how to get these two leaders at BYU to stop fighting. And David O. McKay's idea was to send my grandfather to Hawaii, and he started BYU Hawaii. That's my other street cred. Ruben Law is the founder of BYU Hawaii, and then he started the Polynesian Culture Center, which brings in close to a billion dollars a year, biggest tourist attraction in Hawaii. So no one in my family plays any damn tithing. And um, we got away, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> so anyways, that's kind of my um, <laughs> Mormon street cred. Does that give you context <laughs> here a little bit? And um, all right. So I've had the opportunity to share resilience with many audiences, from athletes to business leaders to schools, the military, and first responders. All of these groups usually receive some greatly deserved accolades, awards, and even parades for their bravery and resilience. I have great, great respect and gratitude for these heroes. I've learned that there's even something even braver. I've learned that one of the bravest things a human being can do is to look deep into the eye of their belief system, culture, heritage, dogma, and traditions. So few people will ever do this. The difficult internal hell that people go through in doing this heroic work is where human progress, I believe, is literally born. It's where it is born. I see this all over. I've traveled over six million miles across this earth. And when I see people look inward, that's where I see progress happen all the time. 
the more we are awake, the more we as humans thrive in almost every, every area of our life. Not when you first go through it, but does that make sense? You'll just hang in there during this journey. You'll thrive tremendously. It's almost it's like it cannot happen over, and it's a different time frame and spectrum for, for everybody. Research that can be measured and verified shows that we are living in a world that is getting better, not worse, and that's the damn truth. The world, the world would be better and more resilient for my children and your children because of the bravery of all of you in this room today. You will not receive a medal or a parade for looking at your faith through a real lens or changing your belief system, although you definitely deserve one. But the emotional and intellectual work you did will be more important and effective in the long term in changing this world than you may see or believe today. The biggest battle we as humans will ever fight is the emotional and intellectual battle between our own ears. A great sign that you are winning this war is when you could break free of man and institutions that have money, power, control, status, and overreach, tremendous overreach into the lives of especially women and children and the LGBTQ plus community. Winning the war, you are winning the war when you realize your relationship with the institution is based on conditional love. And this is one thing that I learned from Margie like five years ago listening to a podcast that helped me understand the difference between conditional and unconditional love. It's based on conditional love. Do what we ask and you have value and worth. When you decide for yourself to walk with others who prioritize unconditional love, you feel safer, healthier, and you are in a better position to trust your own conscience and access the internal resilience that is already within you. The resilient metamorphosis that takes place in you because of social rejection of your tribe, family ostracizing you, community rejection, and sometimes even workplace rejection, one needs a heart and soul bigger than the Grand Canyon. All we can do is be as resilient as we can where we are individually standing with our current emotional state, our current mental health and the resources, our, who our family is, how much money we do or do not have in the bank. Resilience takes place in the effort and the doing. It is not about success or a destination, a homeless man who picks up bottles all day, sleeps under a bridge, and picks up bottles all day, be, be more resilient than me if I disrespected my family or gave up. It has nothing to do with success. It's the ability to bounce back from where you currently stand. You all are truly the most resilient audience I have ever spoken to. I know firsthand the hell and pain that you guys have been through. In my eyes and heart, everyone here is a hero of truth and social justice. And you have already lived up to the highest level in the concept of do what is right, let the consequences follow. And we all know that those consequences are damn painful at times, but the sun will come through the darkest clouds. But in the pain, we find our true selves and our inner resilience. That's the... <laughs> So I want to take you on my resilience journey a little bit, but I, I couldn't even think till I got that out of me. So I, I don't know if that made sense. That was more maybe therapeutic for me. I need help, all right? So <laughs> holy cow. John's like, he's been screaming that at me for 10 years. Like John, <laughs> John's like, please tell someone beside. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was born in a place called Ogden, Utah. My mom got married really, really young, had me and an older sister, and then she got a divorce. She moved back to the Washington, we moved to California for a little bit, then we moved to the Washington, D.C. area, where she met a man who the missionaries had just knocked on his door. He had six kids. His wife had left him with six kids and never came back. Uh, now I'm a psychotherapist. I realize that might have been a hint to my mom. That's another workshop. They get married and have four more kids. 
So a family of 12 kids, five brothers, six sisters. My mom was just a little bit overwhelmed with those 12 kids. You know, I'm a clinical social worker. I have two kids. And, yeah, and I'm overwhelmed half the time. <laughs> What's that? Five, and me, too. I mean, you, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the eighth child. Yeah, so she had me, an older sister, got divorced, met a man with six kids, and had four more and stuff. So, so it was a crazy, crazy journey. My mom had a heart of gold, but was pretty overwhelmed with these 12 kids. My mom had something called social phobia generalized anxiety disorder. My mom had a fear of leaving the house. You have to leave the house to get food. So there wasn't a lot of food to eat in my house growing up. There's usually pickles, olives, and tuna fish. I'm gonna write a cookbook one day, 101 ways how to eat those three things. Um, <laughs> next person to tell you a little bit about is my dad. He's one of the most interesting people in the world. He's not my biological dad. I have a higher IQ. We you know learning disabilities are pretty genetic. When I was 17 years old, I was, I was illiterate. And, um, but again, my dad was the, the complete opposite. Graduated two years early, went to work for the U.S. Postal Service, sorting mail in Arlington, Virginia. And the U.S. Postal Service could tell he had a tremendous talent. You could say to him 5,898 times 10,852, and he could instantly rattle that off the top of his head. Has anybody here ever seen the movie Rain Man? Or Beautiful Mind, especially if you've ever seen the movie Beautiful Mind, you've met my dad. On my dad's 18th birthday, two gentlemen pulled up in front of the U.S. Postal Service in a white car and drove him to a place called Fort Meade, Maryland. Anybody know what's on Fort Meade, Maryland? There's a place called NSA, the National Security, Security Agency. My dad becomes a GS-16 code breaker. That's the highest level spy, the highest level crypt analyst. Um, I don't know if you've been around genius before. You, again, he was, he was in his own world just a little bit. When I was a kid growing up, he never passed up a hitchhiker. He would have a Book of Mormon he loved, the Book of Mormon so much he'd keep it right next to him, right next to his leg in the car, and then there'd be like 10 kids in the car. He would literally stop and pick up hitchhikers. I loved it because they had their Budweiser with them and different stuff. And he would lecture to them about the WOW and all this crazy, it's like, what? Um, and they'd give him a Book of Mormon and he would tell them a story about gold plates and you know, a couple of three years ago, he passed away. I'm wondering if he's using all of his spy skills right now, trying to find Moroni where the damn gold plates really are. But anyways, <laughs> that's a whole nother workshop. But I'm gonna write my memoir is gonna be Who Stole My Damn Golden Plates <laughs> by Christian Moore. that would be coming out in about three years, that memoir. <laughs> Pisses me off rocking a damn house. Oh, I told everybody that on my mission. Anyways, um, and so... <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Oh, man. I've never combined these two worlds. It is so weird. Um, <laughs> this next story is pretty heavy, but I knew this is when I was going to probably one day have to go inactive. When I was a little boy, probably eight, nine years old, my mom had four babies a year apart. I remember one day, and my dad forced us to go to, we never, ever could miss church. I made it through my entire priesthood with never missing a priesthood meeting. I even won a bowling tournament, went up to, Boston, Massachusetts, he drove all the way from Maryland to Boston that Sunday morning made sure I went to priesthood. I mean, he did not play, because of his autism, he's just black and white. You never turn down a calling, you never, I mean, he was, I mean, Mormons are that way in general, but he was that times three. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so he just kicked that up a few notches. And my um, mom, one day, walked out of the house to go to church, and this is like 24 hours after she had this baby, and I'm starting yelling, Mom, Mom, you're bleeding. I can see the, bl the blood coming down her leg. And I said, Dad, my dad's like, you still got to go. I'll run in and get you some Kleenex. And I'm like, no, she can't go to church. My dad's like, you know, it's okay. We, we don't miss church. She'll be and I'm just like, how do people get this dogmatic? And this is crazy. And it was a life-changing moment in my life. I've never shared that out loud. I don't know the total context why that was so life-changing. But it was, I just knew something is not right in this situation, in, in this home. Um, the, um, again, my, my dad was a very kind guy, had a heart of gold, but again, was just very obsessive with Mormonism. Um, because of my parents' mental health issues, I was a street kid. I could hang out till two, three o'clock in the morning on school, and I had no rules, no boundaries. My dad, when I'd walk out the house, he would just say, now do what Jesus would do, but there were no rules with that. Does that make sense? So I was like, <laughs> All right, I don't, well, okay, there's a lot of options here. Um, I can go out and minister in the streets. And um, <laughs> where I grew up, I was a little white kid with curly hair and dimples in a predominantly African-American community. And these older kids, you know, quickly introduced me to the urban pharmaceutical industry. They would, um, 
they would put all the drugs on me because, again, I was this cute little white kid with curly hair and dimples. Now they train me. They're like, Christian, if you use drugs, we'll kill you. If anybody messes with you, we'll kill them. I was the safest child in America. So I was this little white kid with a hop in my step, tons of attitude. And if anybody at school wanted to fight me or come out, they'd be like, do not touch him. Because I've got this powerful, powerful support system around me. Well, so they taught me, look, Christian, if the police roll up on us, you run and talk to the police. Because they knew the police were likely to just take me home. So they'd keep all the drugs on me because they knew I wouldn't be checked. The police would roll up, they'd hand me Washington Redskin football cards and take me home. The police never checked me. So by the time I was you know, seven, eight years old, I became highly, highly aware of social injustice in the United States. It's definitely what inspired me to become a social worker and do some of the work I'm doing around the world right now. Well, one night, I'm out late at night, and a car pulls up, and the windows on the car slowly, slowly roll down. And the neighborhood I grew up in, guess what you do when that happens? You want to get down really quick. And I hear a voice, and the voice I hear is the voice of, um, actually, let me skip ahead here, sorry. The voice <laughs> that's haunting me twice. This, this incredible woman right here, who I endearingly call Mama Jackson. Now see if you can figure out who I am in the picture. Um, <laughs> that's me in my Washington Redskins Sears catalog. This is why I started putting dippity doo in my hair to get the curl up. This is my buddy Sean. I could only hang out with Sean till five, six o'clock at night. Because Mama Jackson knew it all, you know, good moms know who your children hang out with. It's going to have a tremendous impact on their future. So she sees me out there in the middle of the night. She knows what I'm out there doing. And she's like, look, Christian, don't you ever set foot on our property ever again. And she's like, I'm going to call the school tomorrow. I'm going to make sure you're not in any of Sean's classes. And I remember thinking to myself, dang, I know I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. I could never go to school with him ever again. Well, luckily, Sean started explaining to his mom the reality of my home life. He's like, look, mom, I go over to Christian's house. It's a weird house. They got all these kids in this house. We lived in a little duplex in this poor community. And he's like, there's hundreds of holes in the wall. I'd come home from school every day, open up the refrigerator, you know, 500 times, hoping that something magically would appear. And then I start punching holes in the wall, fighting with my siblings. Depending where my mom's mental health was, she'd wash my sheets for me every single night. So I never had to sleep in the same sheets twice. My wife, Wendy, has not caught the vision of that. She makes me sleep in the same sheets more than one night. She actually, she actually heard me say this the other day at a conference with like 1,200 people. She's like, you wash your own damn sheets. Now, anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sean explained some of this bizarreness to his mom. And a couple days later, I'm walking to school, and Mama Jackson comes flying out of her house in this blue bathrobe. And she's like, I'll tell you what, Christian. If you'll start going to school every day, I want to see your report cards. If you start answering to me, you can come eat in our house anytime you want. Now, Mama Jackson's a seriously, seriously good cook. That's the real reason why I'm in top physical condition right now. <laughs> so it's pretty much informal foster care situation. She took over and started raising me. Well, long, long story short, she gave me the tools to graduate from college with a sixth grade math level, a seventh grade reading and writing level. That might not sound that significant to you, but at the U.S., only 2% of my peers in special ed get a bachelor's degree, and 0.5%, not even 1%, get a master's degree. So statistically, I had a better chance of playing the NBA and becoming LeBron James than stand up here right now and tell you this crazy story. That means 99.5% of my peers you know, in special ed don't get the opportunity I received. Then I learned that I did my thesis in graduate school looking at the impact that learning disabilities has on poverty and crime. I learned that over 70% of youth in our youth correction system have a learning difference over 80% of the adult prison population have a learning difference. Over 70% of people on TANF on public assistance. But when you hear about these issues, you don't usually hear. And it, there's many reasons someone's locked up besides a learning disability. It's just like a pie, one slice of the pie. It could be mental health issues, learning disabilities. Anyway, so I don't get into all that. But okay, but basically, um, when I graduated, that's a whole nother long crazy story, but I made it through BYU. And no one in my immediate family came to my graduation, but Mama Jackson got on an airplane flew 2,000 miles across the United States, was sitting on the 10th row in the Marriott Center when they handed me my MSW. And by the way, she was very easy to spot in that audience. I, um, <laughs> I thought to myself, before I'm six feet under, I'm gonna make sure every child in this country has access to the social and emotional education she gave me. Um, little side note, now we've reached over three million students. A gentleman about a, two years ago, came across my book, a guy named Dr. Virgil Wood, who's one of Dr. King's best friends. He helped plan the march on Washington with Dr. King. Read the book, learned that we've reached three million kids, learned about Mama Jackson. And last year, they gave her the National Rosa Parks Award in Washington, D.C., so that was um, really cool. Yeah, yeah. So 
So to say I hit the lottery with Mama Jackson is, is an understatement. She would, um, sometimes what I'd miss, some school years I'd miss over 100 days of school and she'd come over to my house and pick me up and she'd buy me some, you know, she'd stop by McDonald's or she'd, my favorite thing in the world, she'd have this green plate, I can still see it with warm food on it wrapped in tin foil. And she'd sit out in front of my elementary school sometimes for an hour or two hours and talk to me. But what she started to do, she would say, look, Christian, I cannot get rid of your parents' mental illness, your parents' divorce. What Mama Jackson would do is she would say, look, Christian, I can't get rid of these problems in your life. You have to use these problems as a reason to turn in your homework, stay in school, make better decisions. And she started planting the seeds of what to do with my negative emotions. I went to college and they told me to get rid of my negative emotions. My religion taught me to sing hymns and, and not to have negative emotions, that something's wrong with me if I have negative emotions or negative stuff comes from Satan, positive stuff comes from, I've just socialized this way my entire life. And she started really showing me, hey, Christian, there's no law in the universe that says you cannot take this hurt and this pain and do something positive with it, something productive. So again, I hit the lottery having her show up in my life. Um, and so I spent the last, again, 20 years, I'll just give you a quick example. I spent the last 20 years taking everything in mental health, making it visual for kids and families. Um, and we would make it visual, reinforce it with music, physical activities. For example, I had to learn how to stop crashing in my life. I had to realize that behavior A plus behavior B will equal consequence C. I had to tear off my labels. I had all these labels right here growing up, failure, druggy, learning disabled, dumb, lazy, rebellious, and so on. Um, I had to learn how to control my defense mechanisms. When I was in school, the teacher would say, Christian, turn to page 130 and read out loud. I didn't know how to read, so I'd say F you to the teacher, punch the kid next to me, because I'd much rather be sent to the principal's office for acting out behaviorally than having 30 kids laughing at me, because I don't know how to read. That didn't go over too good at BYU, but the, um, <laughs> and so, this is a tribute to my home state of Maryland. If you put a bunch of live crabs in a pot, if you don't put a lid on a pot, why can't the crabs get out of the pot? And the kids would go, well, duh, the other crabs are reaching up and pulling them down. So anyways, we reinforced these visual metaphors with music, rap, hip hop music, hundreds of physical activities, art activities. And that's what kind of three million kids, but I noticed something. We, we could figure out what skills to teach kids, what life skills to teach, but hundreds of educators started saying to me, Christian, where does the inner motivation, where does the internal resilience come from to stop crashing or to tear off those labels, to get out of that pot? And so I would give them my Mormon quote. I would go, all you can do is teach kids life skills. The inner motivation has to come from within. Because <laughs> what works with one, anybody ever heard this speech before? Because <laughs> what works with one person isn't gonna work. And I, and I would give this speech to people. Anyway, so this one Polynesian lady heard me say this at three or four conferences. And she said, why don't you stop and think about it? where does resilience really come from? Where is it born? And I realized I had spent my entire social work career with just people like me. To, to meet with a social worker like me, you have to be in crisis, have a major problem. That's the population I work with. But I was doing some work in, from inner city Detroit to Baltimore to LA, and I knew there was a population that were high flyers. They, I remember meeting a kid in Baltimore who had a scholarship at, to John Hopkins, and he, he made my childhood look like Disneyland. These are kids with high trauma but are high flyers. I would never work with that population or study that population. Does that make sense? Because why would I study that population? I'm a social worker. I'm gonna work with people in crisis, right? And I said to myself, wait a minute, I wanna know what the crap are these people tapping into? Does that make sense when they have every problem under the sun, but they're not hurting them. But the goal is they're just not hurting themselves or others is what we looked at success. Does that make sense? You're not hurting yourself or others. You're not committing a crime. You're productive. You're giving something back to society. And we looked at thousands and thousands of people in that situation. And we kept seeing four themes pop up over and over again. That's what I want to share with you, some of the, those themes. So I want to answer a question. There's hundreds of books on resilience. You, every book I read on resilience drove me crazy because they would only tell me the attributes of resilience, hard work, determination, perseverance. I wanted to know, again, where does it come from within? Could we crack that code? Even when I was at BYU, when I saw the research, they did a 20 year longitudinal study in Kauai called the Resilience, the Kauai Resiliency Project. And they wanted to know, you know, two kids grew up in the same home, the same background. One kid makes it out, the other kid doesn't make it. I saw this in my own family. I had uh, older, some older, older siblings spent time incarcerated, and I had a sister who's homeless right now, and she's a prostitute in Virginia. We grew up in the same home, same neighborhood, same background. Why was I able to make it out? And so just answering that question. Everybody with me on that? Anybody else ask themselves that question? What is the X factor that enables people to, be, to bounce back? And they found... This 20-year study found the secret was 
you have to see your problem as your best friend. I'm like, you have to see your problem as a resource. That's a very different lens. Does that make sense to look through? That's, that's not a little bit of a different lens. That's a massive different lens. So when I saw that data, I was like, and I remember my professors at BYU saying, Christian, you can't hand somebody resilience. Does that make sense? Well, you'll never be able to answer that question. It's just the human beings are too complex. What works with one person is not going to work with another person. But now we've literally looked at thousands and thousands of people who are being resilient, who are bouncing back again. They'll usually tap into two of these four sources. So if, if I was going to pass away tomorrow, I know if this sounds a little bit morbid. Holy cow, I'm running out of time. All right. <laughs> um, all my friends, John's like, can he really speak? in an hour. <laughs> I know you're worried, John. I got this. Relax. Um, and so, <laughs> so um, let me pull this up here. If I was going to pass away tomorrow, someone said to me, what's the last advice you would give your two boys, Cooper and Carson? I would tell them that the second most powerful thing their dad ever came across on planet Earth, according to Christian Moore, whatever the heck that means, but according to me, take a little bit of granted, so according to me, that's the second most powerful thing I've ever come across, is to see your problem, to see the pain, to see the suffering as a fuel source. No one has exposed me to anything more powerful than that, except for one thing. It's funny, I went to Greenleaf, my book publisher, and I said, I want to name the book Resilience, the second greatest principle in the world. And they're like, Christian, you live in America. Do you think anybody cares what the second greatest principle in the world? In America, they want to know what? The first was the greatest principle in the world. Anybody want to take a guess what the greatest... If, Seeing your problem as your best friend. What's the greatest thing you've ever ex- experienced in life? Besides leaving the Mormon church. The, um, what's the greatest thing you've ever experienced? And we all know that the Beatles got it right when they said all you need is love. There may have been a few more teachers before the Beatles that taught this, but I'm going to give credit to the Beatles because everybody else was a myth. Okay. The, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> in general. See, now I just lost 30% of the audience. Um, <laughs> I've wanted to say that for the last 20 years. That was, kind of, that was the, I'm not being, my fellow mental health workers like Christian, you're not being, no, this is about me up here right now. You know, the, uh, you're not up here killing me on, on the mental health. Okay, you know, I got to have Natasha check in. All right, I'm not, Natasha, you know, if I cross anything mental health wise, you, you, you chat. Okay, okay, all right. All right, all right, all right. So far, you're with me still? Okay, all right. Well, Natasha, man, she's in the room. You, you, you know, you better have your crap together. Um. <laughs> um. Okay, no, 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 she's awesome. No, she's, no, you know, I, I, I preface it. She's very competent in what she does. So I, you know, she's competent in my field tremendously. So I have huge respect for her. So you know what I'm saying. So she's the real deal. All right. So you agree with me so far? Love is the, probably one of the most powerful things. So um, in the world of resilience, we've been able to identify exactly what that love needs to look like. We all know there's two types of love. We have Conditional love or unconditional. Conditional love is a business owner. You know, I have 22 employees. I have to be conditional sometimes. My employees don't do A, B, or C. I might have to fire them. It's the worst being a social worker and owning a company because I never planned on having to fire people. I'm trying to help people heal. It's very painful. But it's, it has to be conditional sometimes. If you want control over people, create conditions. If you want money, power, status, communicate to people. You jump through these hoops. You do what we ask you are in good stand. That, that is not condition, that is unconditional, that's conditional love, which is not, does not create motivation. It creates status, money, control, and power. Does that make sense? That's the fastest way to get it. I'll be honest, as a business owner, I can access all those things. Does that make sense? Because my company has a conditional, does that make sense, environment. If you want to make cash flow, <laughs> create conditions. But if you want people to bounce back from pain, we have to put them and in more of an unconditional environment. And this is what, when I first learned this, is from Margie right here breaking down in a podcast with John like five years ago. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even get unconditional love until Margie started explaining that it's letting people know they have value and worth whether they succeed or whether they fail. And then I was like, oh, it's not contingent upon anything. Am I representing you okay, Margie, there? Is that accurate? <laughs> okay. So that was one of the most powerful, powerful things. It was life-changing for me to understand what unconditional love really is. And so one thing is it's awesome. We're teaching literally hundreds of thousands of teachers, educators on how we call it surrendering the one-up relationship. 
So you, especially kids, oftentimes they feel one down in the relationship. They see the parent up here, the judge, the teacher, the probation officer, and they're one down. And we have over 100 strategies on how to surrender this one-up relationship, how to flip that dynamic. As a therapist, what I do is I have two chairs in my office. I pull that chair up, but it can't come out. I have a $2,000 leather chair. I have a metal folding chair. When the kid comes in, I'll say, pick a chair, either chair. They'll head right to the metal folding chair because they know they're in trouble. And right before their bottom sits in the metal folding chair, I'll say, no, 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 no. You sit in a nice leather chair. They'll plop down my leather chair. They'll spin around three or four times. They'll have a party in the leather chair. And then about eight to 12 minutes, I'll say, later, they'll say, hey, Mr. Moore, here's your chair back. And I'll say, no, no, no. You lived your life for the past 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years. You stay in the nice leather chair. Because when I ask that kid to go back to class, turn in their homework, stay in school, walk away from the, the drugs, the gang, it's not because of a magic intervention or program. 80% of change, especially in a child's life, is going to come from a relationship, a relationship. Human beings we know are motivated by other human beings. Is that right, Natasha? Okay. I'm not blowing smoke. Right? Okay. All right. Again, I love it. Can you travel with me on the road? I mean, that would be my dream, man. Gosh, Natasha in the house. Um, <laughs> so, so in the book I define resilience it's the ability to balance back when you have every reason to shut down but you fight on resilient people have both tapped and untapped reserves what I mean by untapped reserves is I only had two talents growing up I could talk non-stop and I could draw really good guess how I make a living today I took everything in mental health made it visual and I talked non-stop this is the greatest damn country in the world um, <laughs> so let me pop, maybe I speed up here just a little bit here. Let me pop up here to this gas station. So again, I spent eight years in college, $65,000 being trained in positive psychology. What we say to ourselves is going to lead to our actions, lead to our behaviors. We probably want to say positive things to ourselves. Well, I started traveling all the time. I started reading hundreds of biographies, and I would highlight the minute a person started to change. And guess how much positive self-talk I noticed? Almost zero. It blew me out of the water, especially being raised to LDS. I was like, well, to thrive, you got to think positive, right? There's the self-help positive movement is a multi-billion dollar. But I remember the first time I noticed this, I was reading Christopher Reeve's biography. Everybody know the story of Christopher Reeve? Plays Superman. He gets thrown off the horse. He's paralyzed. He goes to his wife and says, like, please help me commit suicide. I cannot deal with the reality of this pain. I was at the top of the world. I'm rock bottom now. I cannot go on. Christopher Reeve's wife negotiates with him and says, look, just stay alive for the kids. Hang in there. Let's see if you can make a difference in the paralysis community. If you're still hurting in a couple months, we'll reevaluate it. But just, you can see what she's doing. She's just buying time to creep, keep Christopher alive. And everybody knows the rest of that story. He makes a huge difference. But he takes the anger, the sadness, the pain. I'm like, that's fascinating. That's not anything I learned. Does that make sense in Mormonism? That's not anything that I learned even in psychology. It's almost the opposite of everything I had been taught my entire life. And then I remember reading Oprah's biography. Yes, I did read Oprah's biography. That's awesome. It's a little thick. But um, I was reading Oprah's biography, and it's the same thing. I started highlighting the ministry. We know she was severely emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused. She talked about the anger, the pain, the rage, and how she took that to help other women and people heal around the world. And I was like, man, Nelson Mandela took 27 years of being in prison. I was like... What if you started showing people exactly what to do with their negative emotions? And that's kind of this weird movement that, that, that we've created, and it's been a fascinating thing. We've worked, again, with the um, Army. We just got the Air Force is going to start teaching this now. It's one of the most powerful, powerful things that it's just been amazing to see because most of this world, especially in this Christian world, Negative emotions have been demonized. But if you stop and think about it, we have like 45,000 different emotions during the day. Some of those emotions are going to be positive. Some of those emotions are going to be negative. It's as normal as drinking a glass of water to feel a negative emotion. It's the human condition. Everybody does every day. Anybody besides me have negative emotions? You, know, you guys, I will do this in an audience with like... 3,000 people, and I'm not kidding, five hands will go up, because they've all been socialized that something is wrong with them if they have a negative emotion. Does that make sense? That is a, <laughs> that is a, I call that the great lie. Does that make sense? You have been hustled on that your entire lives. Just hold on. That's um, <laughs> so what I realized is all of us have a switch that we can flip. We're going to have a crisis. We're going to have pain, and you, to flip the switch, to, to access 
to flip the switch, switch on this fuel tank to access these emotions right here, you have to flip the switch. And you, the only way you can flip the switch is, and this is kind of the entry way to being resilient. You have to say to yourself, how can I use this suffering? How can I use this pain as a fuel source? How can I use this pain to be kinder to my children, to work harder, to stand up? for social justice or things around. There's no law, again, in the universe that says you cannot create productivity. It's not that the pain, I'm not minimizing the pain and suffering. You guys, I have generalized anxiety disorder. I'm on medication and therapy for generalized anxiety disorder. I know anxiety disorder, he's a speaker, it's crazy. And so, um, but everybody with me on that? Now, if you have chronic mental health issues, you can still do this, but I'm not, you need traditional therapy. Uh, medication. Does that make sense? If you have chronic depression, uh, I want to be very, very clear about that. I'm someone who receives it, but in combination with that, what we're realizing is if we show people that they have this ability to flip their switch and tap into their negative emotions, there's a powerful fuel source here. And again, you do that by saying to yourself, how can I use this suffering as my best friend? Um, I'll give you an example, flipping the switch. I met a man the other day whose 17-year-old son was killed by a 23-year-old drunk driver. And of course, he was beyond. The negative emotions were intense. He said, Christian, honestly, I wanted to kill this young man. I was in intense anger, rage. I kept passing the jail where the 23-year-old was being held. He went to therapy, got some help. He um, got permission to sit down with a 17-year-old young man. And I'm sure many of you have heard similar stories like this. And he sat down with him and said, look, I literally was thinking to myself as I was driving by, if you're dealing with even 5% of the pain I'm dealing with, you're going to need me. I'm going to go through the legal process with you. Only way I can heal is to forgive you. And that young man is like a second son to him. Now, that's, I'm not saying I would have the ability to do that. But do human beings have the ability to flip that switch? You know, me and a bunch of therapists right now and psychologists, I'm working with several universities. Check this out. This is how powerful human beings are with their resilience. We can't find a situation where human beings cannot flip the switch. Everybody, now whether or not they do it or not, it's another workshop, but everybody catch what I just said to you. It's one of the most profound things I've ever learned on planet Earth. We, the mental health world right now, we cannot find a situation where a human being cannot flip the switch. That's how resilient human beings are. If you look at Viktor Frankl, you look at people who went through there during the Holocaust. Now, I'm not saying you have to have insights, like with everything, you have to have the knowledge. You cannot access something you don't know about. And that's why everybody in this room, we all know education is the way out of so many things. But, but most stuff here, we've been socialized to demonize this, especially the spiritual community will use this to control people. Does that make sense? 24 seven, they will beat you over the head with this. It's one way to get money from people is to tell them the only way you can have any redemption is to get rid of these feelings and do what we ask you. And then, and then they resell it back to you and everybody knows the hustle. Please listen to John Larson and he will break this shit down for you. Okay, the, um, but everybody with me on that? It is sold back to you over and over again. Um, anybody besides me have negative emotions? Seriously. I woke up this morning. I kid you not. I looked in the mirror. I'm like, my hairline's receding more. I'm getting shorter, fatter, goofier. I couldn't even find my neck this morning. And so I said, <laughs> so I said, because of that, I'm going to give a better speech today. I mean, it sounds like, uh, does everybody with me on that? Because that's the reality, man. I'm get, I have dealt with all kinds of problems and suffering. Does that make sense? But I, you have a massive advantage on planet Earth if you can see that suffering. Does that make sense? It's a fuel source. It, it just, the whole world shifts. Not that the pain goes away. Please do not hear me. The plane will still suck. Does that make sense? The hurt will still be there. Except you have the ability to keep pushing, does that make sense? To not shut down. And then that creates opportunities that you never see coming. I just worked with a man the other day who had a fear of leaving his house. I got him a job at McDonald's. It took a little bit of time. And he, I, he would get more money by not having this job at McDonald's. I said, you just gotta keep moving. Just keep putting one foot in front of another. About a year and a half later, he was the manager of that McDonald's. He was making like you know, $60,000 a year. But it made no sense for him. Does that make sense at that time? But I said, you have to just stay in motion. That's a lot of this world. If you shut down, it's like anything. That entropy, you know, we know, will kick in. All right, so everybody with me on flipping the switch? So the first thing you have to do to be resilient is have suffering. The second thing you have to do is say to yourself, how can I use this suffering as the greatest resource in my life? I know that might sound crazy the first five times you do that, but then it will, an energy will kick in. Let me, let my wife laughs and we have a crisis. She's like, oh no, here we go, here we go. Wendy's, the smallest bone in Wendy's ear stopped working. 
And she had to get surgery for that. And the family joke is, because you talk nonstop, Christian, I'm losing my hearing. And, um, <laughs> but Wendy said to me, you know, I'm going to create a productive outcome with that. Because my ear, was, I'm going to try to be a kinder mom. I'm going to try to listen better. And I'm like, I don't care about my book right now. I'm having a panic attack, you know, that my wife is losing the hearing in her ear. But she said, I'm going to be a better human being because there's no law in the universe. That's the most powerful thing anybody's ever showed me outside of love. And when you do those two things, love oftentimes gives us the motivation. Does that make sense? To, to grind in those situations. Um, so let me show you how we teach this to youth and families. I use a metaphor of a battery, and I'll say, can you charge a battery with just a positive connection? They're usually going to say no. And I'll say, can you charge a battery with just a neg negative connection? No, we know a battery charges because of what? The positive and negative coming together. So for example, if me being in this room right now speaking to you all was dependent upon these emotions right here. Happiness, peace, motivation, love, trust, and acceptance. Would I be in this room? No, I wouldn't be within 500 miles of this room if it was dependent upon positive psychology or positive emotions. I'm in this room because luckily I had some incredible mentors that showed me what to do with this stuff. Does that make sense? Anger, fear, rejection, sadness, hurt, pain, depression, anxiety, it's going to say this on my tombstone. There's no law in the universe that says you cannot use this as a fuel source. Now, you have twice the fuel to bounce back if you can tap into both your positive and negative emotions. Please do not hear me wrong. If you can tap into this, tap into your positive emotions as much as you can. But think about this. If you have to wait for positive emotions to show up before you can bounce back or push through and not shut down, you're at an actual resilience disadvantage. Everybody catch that? You're at a massive disadvantage if you have to wait for positive emotions to show up. But if you can tap into both positive and negative emotions, you can, you can always fight that fight. Everybody with me on that? You don't ever have to be on shutdown. So what we're realizing today in psychology, by the way, as I've shared this, I just shared this at the University of Wisconsin, one of the top school social works, and they one of their professors, two of them pulled me aside and said, Christian, stop talking about emotions as either positive or negative. What we're realizing today in psychology is they're just emotional states. So they're starting to realize that it doesn't matter whether an emotion is positive or negative. What they care about is, can the person create a productive outcome whether the emotion is positive or negative. Now, I do a lot of work with kids. It's just, like right now, we're teaching tens of thousands of children. Imagine learning this by third grade. The minute you feel sad, angry, or nervous, you have an opportunity to create a productive outcome. Most adults aren't even thinking that. Does that make sense? And so our goal is we think we're going to be able to change this world, change society tremendously, because we're going to have most kids in this country by third grade, they're going to know exactly what to do with their negative emotions. Everybody catch the significance of that? That is huge. Because <laughs> right now, most adults have no concept of that, let alone children. So we're very excited to, to see. And by the way, you guys, it's 100 times easier for us to teach this to children. Because the time you're 25 years old and you've dealt with enough pain, you do not want to see it as your best friend. I can tell you about 10% of this room wants to kill me right now. Does that make sense? Because of what I'm, I'm highly aware of that. But everybody with me on that? And I get that. I understand that because... I would be thinking the same thing by the time I'm 25, 30 years old. Someone's like, hey, use the pause. I'm shut the hell up. It doesn't matter. I get it. And this isn't about turning lemons into lemonade. That is the damn worst quote I've ever heard. This is, not, this is hellish to do that. It's not easy. Does that make sense to take pain and suffering? And so it's much more complex than lemon to lemonade. That's bullshit. Okay. The... Um, <laughs> I was speaking the other day at the University of, by University of Iowa, and I had some professors there from the humanities department that literally blew my mind. They said, Christian, do you realize that the greatest literature, the greatest plays, the greatest music, the greatest artists from, um, they talked about um, Picasso, they said, what they all have in common is they take these emotions and they create a productive outcome with it. They put it into their music, their play. And it's funny, once they showed this to me, that the greatest humanities, the greatest literature that from Hemingway, um, lay mis, it's all people taking suffering, taking pain and creating a productive outcome. You know, um, Picasso, those abstract paintings that he first did is he was angry about the war, you know, in Spain and he put that into those paintings now they're worth, you know, half a billion dollars and it's because, it, and once you see this, you'll start seeing the human condition, what we talk about at people's funerals is what they do with this stuff. But if you go into a bookstore, you go study psychology at a university, they're pretty much only going to talk about this because the Judeo-Christian world, 
has demonized something that is normal as breathing. Does that make sense? It's okay to have negative emotions. It's not okay to hurt yourself or others with them. Everybody with me on that? That's where it crosses that line. But, and then another type of intervention needs to take place, but there's no law in the universe that says you cannot tap in to both of these. What are we doing here on time? All right, 15 minutes. Okay, <laughs> jump into Now, I started eight minutes late, 15, 10 minutes late. Can I go till um, 25 after, John? All right, John gave me permission. I do whatever he says. And um, <laughs> all right, y'all can write him the letter, all right? Um, <laughs> oh. All right, all right. So I mentioned that there are four places the resilience comes from it. So it's one thing to tell a family or a child, hey, we want you to tap into both your positive and negative emotions, but where's the inner motivation gonna come from to do that, right? That's a pretty bold statement to say to, especially someone hurting, hey, I want you to be able to tap into you know, both your positive and negative emotions, but this is where it comes from from within, and this is what we kept seeing over and over. We literally looked at thousands of people, then we spent weeks literally writing down famous people, people from scripture, from all these different things, looking at, okay, what are they tapping into? And again, we would see at least two of these four sources. Now, you can't access all four of them, but when we're looking at people bouncing back, being resilient, again, they're usually tapping two of these. So the first thing we saw is something called, this should not shock anybody, something called relational resilience. This is a picture of my two boys, Cooper and Carson. If I never, ever got invited to speak again, I would literally go work in four fast food restaurants to put food in their stomach. That makes me what? Relational resilient. I'm going to go through the motions. I'm not going to shut down because they need me. I need them. And by the way, the LDS church, <laughs> the reason why your friends and family will not look at the information you have is they do not want to lose that relational resilience. The church is a genius. They're some of the top, probably the top organization in this world that knows how to influence and keep people through relational resilience. Be aware of that. But that's another workshop. I'll have to come back for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> So your greatest motivation to not give up is the knowledge that others need you and you need them. If I said to everybody in this room, write down three people that need you and, and you need them, probably everyone in this room could write down, most people can write down five or 10 or more people. And I believe that's one of the reasons you're in this room right now and not in prison. We work in 200 prisons. When we ask inmates that question, guess how many people they write down? Usually one or less. I'm not saying that's the only reason you're in this room now, but we know that is a major, major X factor. Um, and this is the one. The, the one on the left is St. Cooper. That kid does not have a negative bone in his body. You see that smirk on his face? He has conduct disorder like his dad. i got to keep this child out of prison. Please pray for him. But <laughs> he's the one who had to explain to his teacher that, they're, that all human beings are 99.8% the same genetically, and she did not believe that. And why she's in a school teaching, I have no idea. But, um, but that's another workshop. Okay, i got a lot of other workshops i got to come back for. Holy cow, somebody read a damn book. Okay, um, <laughs> you draw strength from the emotional support of others. I am breaking every rule of public speaking right now. You realize that your greatest power comes from human connection. You know, Mama Jackson was that relationship for me. Um, you know, it's interesting, I, I travel a lot. Some, uh, I've traveled again at least six million miles across this planet. And it's interesting, even Mormon stories has been that relational. Resilient. Just listening to people's lives, like the Youngs and different people. Does that make sense? As I do this, when I feel lonely, that is a powerful, powerful thing. And I think, you know, John has provided that for, for many of you. all give him a hand for providing that for so many of us here. Um, one of my favorite examples of relational resilience are these two guys. Everybody know Dick and Rick Hoyt who ran in over 240 triathlons together? When he became the legs for his son, it completely transformed his life. I'm going to just play a short clip. Our last story this evening features an unforgettable pair of unlikely teammates doing improbable things. I'm talking about Dick and Rick Hoyt, two men who are biologically father and son, yet much more than just a boy and his dad. For 30 years now, the Hoyts have turned individual endurance tests of marathons and triathlons into team events, and the manner in which they've done so has enriched both men. Our Mary Carrillo updates a profile we first visited five years ago. This is where they go to prove their mettle. Endurance racers from around New England, ready to take on an Olympic distance triathlon. 
Those who finish will swim a mile, bike 24, and run six more. All right, welcome everyone. But one man's got a tougher challenge than the rest. And it's not because he's one of the oldest guys here. It's because Dick Hoyt will pull, pedal, and push his son Rick, who was born without the ability to move or speak. This is how father and son spend their time together, nearly every single weekend, going back 30 years. Dick and Rick Hoyt have completed over 240 triathlons, and on their lazier Sunday afternoons, over 68 marathons, the fastest in a time just half an hour off the world record. Yes, the real world record. They say Dick Hoyt could have been an elite endurance athlete on his own. Dick's not so sure. I just don't have the desire to be out there running by myself. I think it's just something that comes from his body to my body, and it makes us go faster. Are you trying to say that you run faster pushing Rick than if you didn't run with him? Oh, yeah. He, he inspires me and he motivates me. And he's actually the athlete, and he's very competitive. He wants to win. I love that he's the athlete. I love that part where he says, I love the part where he says, something comes from his body to my body. See, today in psychology, we know exactly what that is. That's relational resilience. You don't have to be born with it. You don't have to, I have something called reactive attachment disorder. Anybody work with kids in foster care? Both my parents have mental health issues. So you, you, by you know, very young, you should attach with your parents. I didn't have that attachment. So I have to really work on my relational resilience. Um, my friend and my wife, you know, I was married to her for the entire time. I've been traveling, been married to her now 26 years, but we, um, she, she's a saint. Like I traveled 260 days a year for seven years speaking. Everybody catch that? I was on the road 260 days a year speaking. Now, one of the reasons I was 28 years old, I had never made over $6 an hour. And so I had never made a livable wage until almost 30 years old. And I'm like, they will pay me to speak. I'm not going to turn it down. Does that make sense? I traveled 260 days a year. And the reason why I was able to do I got I had no homesickness because I, I had this reactive attachment disorder. But then I worked on it. I had real friends like John and different people who and showed me love and real connection. And I kind of worked through my, some of these issues. And um, it's been an amazing, amazing thing. And so this year traveling is the first year I've ever been traveling and really experienced homesickness where I'm literally in hotel rooms sobbing because I miss my family. And so I've learned that relational resilience is really painful. Um, not <laughs> for a long time, but I hope that's not too much information. But hey, you all a family. Um, <laughs> so let me pull up here. I'm going to highlight a couple more here. Come back here. Uh, all right, let me go right up here. All right, come back. Here we go. All right. So the second place that resilience comes from, from within, is something called street resilience. Now, I really, really struggle at relational resilience. It's interesting, my business partner, his name is Hans. By the way, the co-author with me on this book is a guy named Brad Anderson. He's the one who literally interviewed Covey, Stephen R. Covey, like 30 years ago. And he's like, that's a win. That's, let's call that a win-win. He had like coin win-win, basically, and wrote the corporate curriculum for Franklin Covey. You know, which, so he heard me giving the speech on res, where resiliency comes from quit his job and spent four years writing this book with me. On, on, and so, incredible resource. But Brad, his last name's Anderson. Hans is my business partner. My name's Christian, so Hans Christian. So it's kind of fun. And um, so Hans has like, he has this large family, um, lived down in Provo. I have an entire TBM company. That's another reason I'm under the radar. And I am their apostate bo boss that went rogue. And, um, <laughs> So Hans has, you know, five kids. Hans always makes good decisions. He does tremendous community work, volunteer work, serves in the Stikai Council. Does that make sense? He constantly, constantly is just serving his fellow man, right? And um, so he has an incredible, he always makes good decisions because of relational resilience. I grew up with very little relational resilience. I had something called street resilience. And one day it hit me. If I could teach Hans street re resilience, we could literally double his resilience. If I who could learn 
who has street resilience could learn relational resilience. I could double my resilience, but this is what re is really cool. A university can measure this. Everybody with me? So it's not just a theory, it's something that could actually be measured. And so street resilience is this. Pull it up here, what is this thing doing here? Oh, here we go. So street resilience is You take the pain of disrespect. Anybody here ever feel disrespect in the last few years? <laughs> you take the pain of disrespect, social inequality, and mistakes, and use it as fuel to propel you forward. And it could be any type of disrespect. Human beings will disrespect each other over belief system, height, weight, your teeth aren't white enough, shoes. What are the other reasons we hate each other? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, right. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But the ability to take that disrespect, when we started looking at kids that had high, high, you know, tremendous um, challenges, tremendous pain in their life, trauma, all of them talked about using the disrespect as a reason to turn in their homework, make better decisions, stay in school, get that scholarship. We were fascinated by that. And we, we would ask, because we asked literally over two million kids, what's your biggest problem in school? The number one answer we got is, I feel disrespected. We heard that in all 50 states across this country. So we started realizing, holy cow, if we could show them how to use that disrespect as a fuel source. And if you're an ex-Mormon, you have experienced some disrespect, I promise you. Does that make sense? I mean, you guys are in the massive genius range when it comes to this right here, street resilience. Um, one of my heroes is Dr. Laura Owens here in the room. Is Dr. Owens here? I know she's gonna be, is Owen, Dr. Owens here? Where's she at? Oh my gosh, she's here, in the room. So she's a professor. Is it okay if I share a little bit about you? Or is that, you want me to stay under the, <laughs> under the radar? <rear? laughs> she's in the house, wow. This is one of my uh, mentors. She's looking at doing some research on this. She's a professor at American University. And we're trying to figure that, like Christian, we know where the research behind relational resilience, resource rock bottom. They're like, what the crap are you talking about with street resilience? And she was looking at the lit review and she found that really what I'm talking about here is when a person's identity comes under attack. Is that what you found on that a little bit? Yeah, when their identity comes under attack, that, you know, attack someone's identity and they're almost naturally gonna wanna fight back, come back. And that's what that really is. And then the other thing it says is past mistakes. The ability to use our mistakes. See, the number one thing that kills our resilience, the kryptonite of resilience, is if we cannot forgive ourselves. And in my last chapter in the book, and this is a group that will understand where this came from, <laughs> the only group that will have ever understood this, um, is, is something I call self-grace. You know, usually we have to get grace outside of ourselves, but I know when I went through the LDS repentance process, I would forgive myself, and then I would beat myself up again. I'd mess up again, beat myself up. And when I started figuring out, is if I, it's still great to access something outside of you. I'm not minimizing the importance of that. But you have to give yourself grace first. And even whatever you access outside of you, you're more likely to be able to stick with it, fall through with it, if you forgive yourself first. But we don't do that. Does that make sense? Because until that self-forgiveness comes in, you can have all the outside <laughs> forgiveness and you're likely not going to heal. Everybody with me on that? You, you have to give yourself that grace first. The human condition is to mess up. It's okay to mess up. What's not okay is to get, not get back up and, and keep trying. So... So that self-grace and that forgiveness, self-forgiveness is so important first. You convert the pain into the energy to create productive outcomes. You direct your hurt and anger towards a cause rather than individuals like mothers against drunk drivers would be a powerful example of um, street resilience. You have the ability to reframe your limitations, transform them into strengths. You know, Mandela, a powerful, powerful example of street resilience. I know I'm running out of time, but I can share one story with him. The prosecuting attorney that was seeking the death penalty against Mandela. Mandela reaches out to him and says, look, I made huge mistakes. I'm not the same person. I've learned from this. They connect. He spends a couple hours at his house. He walks out of Mandela's house, and the national media is there in South Africa, and they said, what do you think of Mandela now? This is a direct quote. He said, he's the most saintly man I've ever met. That's the power of street resilience. That makes it to use disrespect as a reason to be kinder, to work harder, to not give up. And that's why you show street resilience when you're talking to someone and they ask you about why you left Mormonism and you're thinking to yourself, 
you don't even, I don't want you to have the pain <laughs> to go through. You're not ready to know why I left. Does that make sense? That's using that. Even though they maybe disrespected you, they're judging you, and you're still biting your tongue. Now, most of the time, I tell people what the hell is up, but, the, um, <laughs> but in general, the, the, John's looks like, Christian, calm it down, bro. But um, then it's healthy because we need to respect people where they are. But everybody with me on that, that street resilience is sometimes that ability to do the harder thing. Does that make sense? Even when you know you could defend yourself, you could come down with a hammer, you could explain the real story of everything. But, no, but does that make sense? It's just the ability to hold that back sometimes is, is, is so, so powerful and important. Um, you know, Rosa Parks refusing to sit on the back of the bus is a powerful example. I had a professor who came to me at BYU and said, Christian, if you can get a college degree, my degree is worth less. I literally walked home in tears. At the time, I didn't know what nine times six was. I didn't know how to tell time on a hand clock to me. A quarter to five equals 25 minutes to five. But they tell me a quarter is what? How could a quarter not be 25? I mean, please don't drop me any pie chart. Anyway, so he was like, you don't even know how to, he said, type, I was his TA, he's like, type into my computer psychological assessment. I'm like, psychological, S Y, psychological, S Y, C. He's like, you don't even know how to spell psychological? And you're in graduate school at BYU. Uh, my claim to fame, I'm the dumbest person to go to that university. And, um, and so he says, look, Christian, if you get a college degree, my degree's worth less. You shouldn't even be on this campus. How did you even get here? He was not real happy. And I walked home in tears. I just found out this year that professor will be teaching out a two-college textbook, the Introduction to School Social Work textbook. One of the books we're in there is Evidence-Based RTI, PBIS. He actually has to lecture on my theories now. How you like me now? So that's the thing. There go. Only in America, only in America. <laughs> um, Abraham Lincoln, powerful, powerful example of street resilience. You know, Cesar Chavez, what he did for migrant farm workers, his breaking point was when he, he saw them charging like 50 cents for a cup of water. They'd have these trucks in the middle of the fields with these big barrels on it. And that's really when he saw they're, they're being paid very little. And now we're going to charge them for a cup of water. And that's really was his trigger point to unionize them. And we know what he did with that disrespect. Um, Gandhi, what he did, um, what John did, Lynn did. Y'all get again, man. He did that street resilience. This mug has so much damn street resilience, you can't even see straight. And with Margie as well, did. Thank you. The, um, and I need to say Margie first. I apologize. I, it's my Mormon. Oh, men are more important. Shit. And the, um, I'm sorry, Margie. I apologize deeply. It's just. 50 years of bullshit socialization, all right? <laughs> Women should run this world. Forget John, he ain't shit. He ain't shit. He wouldn't have done nothing without Margie up in this damn house. Shit, sit your ass down, John. Thank you, Margie, for your day there. Hey, shit. Good night. Good talk. Just listen to her talk a hundred times smarter than John's at. Okay. The, um... <laughs> so... <laughs> Anybody see Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech? They say it's one of the worst Hall of Fame speeches of all time. Now you know what street resilience is. I want you to listen to this right here. And then we'll wind this up here in just a second here. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't stop talking here. In nature, it's gone a long way from the first time I picked up any sport. Baseball, football, ran track, basketball, anything to miss class, I played it. Uh, when you think about, you know, so they started the fire in me. You know, that fire started with my parents. And then, you know, as I moved on in my career, people added wood to that fire. Coach Smith, you know, what else can I say about him? You know, he's a legendary in, his, you know, in the game of coaching. And then there's Leroy Smith. Now, you guys think that's a myth. Leroy Smith was a guy, when I got cut, he made the team on the varsity team. And he's here tonight. He's still the same 6'7 guy. He's not any bigger. He's, he's probably his game is about the same. <laughs> but he started the whole process with me because when he made the team and I didn't, I wanted to prove not just to Leroy Smith, not just to myself, but to the coach who actually picked Leroy over me. I wanted to make sure you understood. You made a mistake, dude. <laughs> And then there's Buzz Peterson, my roommate. You know, 
When I first met Buzz, all I heard about was this kid from Asheville, North Carolina, who's a player of the year. I'm thinking, well, he ain't never played against me yet. <laughs> so how did he become player of the year? Is that, a, is that some type of media you know, exposure? You know, I came from Wilmington. You know, we had two channels, channel ABC and channel, 7, uh, channel NBC. That was it. I never saw NBA sports at all when I grew up. You didn't have CBS affiliation in, uh, in North Carolina, in Wilmington. So Buzz Peterson became a dot on my board. <laughs> and when I got the chance to meet Buzz Peterson on the basketball court or in person, Buzz was a great person. It, it wasn't a fault of his. It was, it was just my competitive nature. Was, I didn't think he could beat me, or he was better than me as a basketball player. And he became my roommate. And from that point on, he became a focal point not well, yeah, I do have to point out he did push off on Brian Russell in the playoffs. I do want to point that out. But um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'll get therapy for that. But um, <laughs> but what would happen if all of us Exmos had that mentality? Does that make sense? We we had the ability to use that disrespect because we're going to get disrespected. I live in Provo, Utah. Does that make sense? If you don't think I'm going to get disrespected, I mean, my neighbors have lit me up. All these now the cool thing is they're all pulling me aside the last two years now, going wow, you actually knew what you were talking about. <laughs> and I'm like, well, thank you. I had one who was driving down the Provo Canyon the other day with a friend. I sh showed him the eight different versions of the first vision. We're driving down the Provo Canyon. He's a bishop. He's sobbing because he showed the video of the eight different versions. And he, 10 years ago when I told him about that, he said, you know, Satan's taking you over. And he goes, Christian, I get it now. You're doing this because of integrity. I'm like, yeah, how you like me now? <laughs> Anyways, um, how you like me now? Now the truth is coming out. Sit down. The... Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you guys, that's going to happen more and more over the next few years. Everybody with me on that? So we have to be compassionate. Does that make sense? We are standing. Listen, I have never, like, I was aware. I knew when I was a little boy, the civil rights issue was wrong. Being a white kid raised in an African-American home, I knew my church had that wrong. Women's rights, I knew they had that wrong. LGBTQ rights, history. I have never stood on the wrong side of history. And I promise everybody in this room, no one is standing on the wrong side of history right now. Just hang in there, I promise you that. It's gonna come. All right, the, um, you know, women making 78 cents on a dollar that a man makes. Every woman in this room better have some serious damn street resilience. We gotta change things. And then Malala, you know, shot by the Taliban. You know, she recently stood up in front of the UN and said, until the man who shot me, until his daughter can receive an education, I'm gonna speak out. And we know tens of thousands of young women around the world are receiving an education because of Malala street resilience. It's, it's changing the world. Everybody in this room, because of what you've been through, you are in the genius range when it comes to street resilience. Everybody here is highly, highly street resilient. You could not do what you did without massive street resilience. So do, but, 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 tap into that. In my book, we, I have 27 strategies, how to develop your relational resilience, your street resilience. We have something called the ask and task, where you have to ask yourself to develop the skill and a specific task you can see in a camera. You guys, so I'm giving you like 5% of this. Everybody on that? And so the, um, all right, and then the, let me wind this up. Let me just pull this up real quick. So the third place, resilience. These are some of the emotions you can tap into with street resilience. And then the third place, resilience comes from is something called resource resilience. I'm just going to highlight this really quick. Um, this guy's fishing on the Provo River there. Did he put the river there? No, he's accessing a resource. He has the waders, the fly rods. All of us have, cannot be resilient in a vacuum. We have to have help from other people and resources. You recognize that your resources include talents, relationships, physical assets, personality traits, and work ethic. Um, you realize that you have undeveloped talents and capabilities you can develop. One of my favorite examples, I'll end on this one, is Kyle Maynard. He's born with no arms, no legs, with just these little you know, stubs. He put rubber balls in the end of his stubs last year and hiked to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Just like my man Sam Young just did, advocating for children, um, but made it to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Literally crawled up there. He wrestled in high school and college. I get to see him a couple times a year at different conferences. And last time I saw him, he's like, "Christian, how do you two arms work for you?" I'm like, "Really good." He's like, "How do your legs work for you?" I'm like, "Great." And he's like, "If I had access to your arms, your legs, I'd take a little better care of myself." I was gonna knock the little dude out. I'm like, "You can't talk to me like that, man. Freak. I'm Christian." Moore. And so I went off of, um, of Coca-Cola for about th three days. And um, 
Is it? It's actually true. <laughs> Um, and then the last place resilience comes from. Tell the painting story. Oh, should I tell the painting story real quick? The, um, all right. So, <laughs> so Wendy, my wife, oh, that's a crazy story. So Wendy, basically, I start dating this girl. I, th I fall in love with her. I want to marry her, but I don't run a, know how to run a cash register at McDonald's. So I break up with her. I said, Wendy, you want to work with these people who work in these high-tech companies, people who are functional, who can make over $50,000 a year. I break up with Wendy. She comes to me a couple days later, and she's like, I know you're learning disabled, dumb, lazy, rebellious, attitude problem, troublemaker. She gets down on one knee and proposes to me. She says, if you marry me, you never, ever have to get a job. I'll support you. I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. I looked at her, I thought to myself, I may be learning disabled, but this homeboy ain't stupid, that's the woman for me. And I, um, I married her, because I really did love her, not because I never had to work another day in my life. By the way, I want to point out she's very manipulative, because the last 20 years, I've worked over 100 hours a week, if you look at my travel time. I was like, a couple years ago, I was the third most frequent flyer on Delta out of Salt Lake. Does that, I mean, so you, you, you see her manipulation? Anyways, totally take advantage. And so, um, so we're married for a couple of years, and she had lost her job. We didn't have money. The rent was $300. We didn't have money for the rent. She had a, Chevy, a red Chevy Cavalier when I married her. I, thought it was, I never thought I could own a car. Because remember, I was 28 years old. I had never made it over $6 an hour. I had a fear of going into a grocery store. I had literally a phobia of a grocery store. Because what's the last thing you have to do when you leave a grocery store? It's pay. And I'm almost 30 years old. I can't even, you know, you see the issue here. And so Wendy, um, we don't have enough money for the rent. And I go out to the Red Chevy Cavalier, I'm sizing it up. I'm like, maybe we could, we could go live up in the Provo Canyon. We could live in the car for a little bit. And I have a panic attack. And I run back in the house. I'm like, Wendy, I told you not to marry me. It's because of you. We're about to become homeless. I mean, totally dysfunctional. And I start screaming at her. And then she's pissed. She leaves. I'm like, oh, crap. This is not going to work. Oh, man, she's, up not, she's pretty upset. So remember, my only skill is I can talk and I can draw really good. So I go down to the river bottoms in Provo, take some pictures of these big multi-million dollar homes. Now this is actually a home in San Francisco I painted, but I, um, I go down to the river bottoms, take pictures of these homes, and then I did these watercolor paintings of like three of these homes. And then I would knock on the door and I'd say, I'm a local artist in the area, I was admiring your beautiful home, I'd like to sell you this painting for like, you know, $200. And the first house I knocked on, the woman of the house came to the door, gasps at the painting, and she goes, oh my gosh, I have artwork I've spent thousands of dollars on that I don't like any more than this. She goes, I'll be back in a few minutes. She comes back with a check for $600. And I literally floated off that doorstep. <laughs> and I knew in that moment, I was, I could, you know, I have this resource of resilience. I can go paint rich people's houses. I've never get invited to speak again. I can go paint rich people's houses and feed my family. That makes me what? resource resilient. Everybody with me on that? And so that's the, so we try to help people understand all we can do is maximize these resources, these abilities that we have. You know, Helen Keller is a powerful, powerful example of that. Um, you know, I, have a, I don't do this in isolation. I have a massive team behind me of therapists, um, psychologists, um, researchers, you know, the incredible Dr. Laura Owens in the house. Um, incredible, incredible people. And by the way, this woman has helped literally thousands of kids across this country, hundreds of thousands of people. She is in this room. I just found out the other day that she was gonna be here, and I was like, wow, I knew that lady was bright. But um, if everybody can give her a hand, I appreciate it. She's like, oh no. <laughs> it's amazing who shows up. Um, <laughs> resource resilience, and then the last one is rock bottom resilience. And that's when you have every reason to give up. You're able to put one foot in front of another and not shut down. And I'm going to be in trouble if I don't stop talking. Now, we, I just want to show one picture with resource resilience. We all have our own personal rock bottom. If I was your therapist, I'd figure out what the worst moment of your life is. Then I would try to show you how to use that as a fuel source. Um, it's kind of my goal in, in, in every therapy session. Um, so... One day it hit me, I could learn more from a single mom living in a car with three kids than if I studied my friend Covey or Anthony Robbins. By the time you have a helicopter, you ought to be resilient. And so um, one day it hit me, this mom, you know, living in this tent, you know, with these two kids, six months 
after this picture was taken. The problem may not have gone away, but you see the look on her face? She is not going on shutdown. I don't even have words in the English language to describe that look of grit, determinations, but you can see she is not going on shutdown. That's that rock bottom resilience. And, and again, we, we're starting to realize we cannot figure out a situation where human beings cannot tap into that. Now, the, whether they're aware of that or not is another workshop, it, it, but, but we all have, resilience is already inside of us. Everybody already has it. It's just having the tools to pull it out. You know, Robert Downey Jr., the first six times he was arrested, he wasn't willing to change, but that seventh time, that rock bottom time, I'm not saying encouraging people to go down that road, but, um, all right, and then I want to end with, in the 1992 Olympics, there's a guy named Derek Redmond. He comes in literally last place. You're going to see his relational resilience is going to show up. You're going to see his street resilience come out. They're going to ask him to get off the track because he's cutting to Olympic commercial time, which costs literally millions of dollars. You're going to see him maximize his resources, his physical body, his talents, his abilities to be there. And this is his rock bottom moment. And you're going to see him flip the switch. So look for all four sources of resilience, and then we'll be done here. And by the way, you guys have been the greatest audience I have ever spoken to. Man, I wish I could take you all on the road, man. All right, all right here. Derek Redmond, the best form he's shown since he broke the British record. When you try your best, but you don't succeed When you get what you want, but not what you need When you feel so tired, but you can't sleep Stuck in rivers And the tears Come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace When you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be worse? Redmond has broken down He's on the track will guide you home and ignite your bones and I will try to fix you
The winner of that race, very, very few people remember. But millions and millions of people know who Derek Redmond is. It's because resilience is a much higher principle than success. I'd rather my two boys have the ability to bounce back from life's lows than to be, quote, successful. Success is fleeting. It comes, it goes. I've experienced the highest highs, the lowest lows. But the, again, I'd rather my kids be able to get through those lows. I believe one of the biggest social justice issues in the next 20 years is millions and millions of kids and families are going to get access to evidence-based resilience. And many aren't. Our fellow saints believe they have to work out their salvation. And I'm telling you, Whatever is good in this universe has created the human condition is so much pain, so many challenges. I firmly believe whatever created us, the universe, whatever that is, the higher power, its grace is sufficient and it loves everybody in this room. And you are completely sufficient where you stand right now. And you have that internal resilience. Never, ever forget that. Thanks for your time. Thank you for tuning in today. For other Thrive presentations and future Thrive events, visit thrivebeyondmormonism.com.